You're listening to The Secrets of Doctor Who, where we discuss everything about the hit BBC series, Doctor Who. And today we're discussing the second Doctor story called The Dominators. I'm Dom Bettinelli, and joining me today on the panel are Jimmy Aiken. Hey, Jimmy. Howdy, Dom. And Father Corey Stika. Hey, Father Corey. How's it going? Folks, be sure to get your very own Secrets of Doctor Who t-shirt or a phone case or something else with our fun artwork on it by visiting sqpn.com slash merch. Uh, I want to tell you about another show on the StarQuest Network you are sure to enjoy called Raising the Bets, a show that I do with my wife, Melanie. And you can find that wherever fine podcasts are found or at sqpn.com slash bets. That's B-E-T-T-S. And finally, stick around to the end because we've got some of your great listener feedback that we want to share with you. But we are talking about the Dominators. And Jimmy, can you give us a recap of what happens in the story? This week, the second Doctor, Jamie, and new companion Zoe go to the peaceful planet Dulcus, which is being threatened by a race of men who have the tallest, most horrifying bulbous shoulders or shoulder pads that you've ever seen. They're called the Dominators, and they're really into their hobby of dominating things. And they're served by a bunch of robots called Quarks. Unfortunately, although the uh, natives of the planet, the Dulcians, used to have advanced weapons, they're now pacifists, which makes them good subjects for the Dominators' dominating hobby. And the Dominators want to either kill or enslave the Dulcians. Even worse, the Dulcians wear horrifying bunched-up window curtains around their midsections. So, anyway, the Dominators are drilling to create a volcano on an island, and they plan to drop a seed device into it that will destroy the planet and allow them to charge up their spaceships. The Doctor, Jamie, and Zoe must convince the Dulcians to defend themselves. The Doctor makes homemade hand grenades for Jamie to use to destroy the quarks. They dig a tunnel to intercept the seed device when it's dropped, and when that happens, the doctor catches the seed device, but he's unable to defuse it, so he hides it aboard the Dominator's spaceship, causing it to explode and kill the Dominators when it takes off. The ever-bloodthirsty doctor is pleased with himself, but Jamie points out that they still have to deal with the newly formed volcano on the island. The Doctor is horrified when he sees lava flowing towards them, giving us a cliffhanger that will lead into the next second Doctor story, The Mind Robber. The end. Very good. So uh, let's quickly just give our first impressions. Uh, what did you think of this one, Father Corey? You know, I kind of enjoyed it. Of course, it was nice, first of all, that this is one of the, the second Doctor episodes that it all exists in its original video. And so that, that, that of course, you know, brings a little bit more enjoyment where you actually get to see the, the second doctor and Jamie, especially in, in their, their, all their actions, you know, they're, they're very, very entertaining to say the least. Uh, it, it actually wasn't too bad. No one, when it was, it was cut down from six episodes to five, according to the wiki. And I think that helped it a lot. It wasn't quite so much of the running around corridors or in this case, running around on beaches and through hills, quarries and, quarries <laughs> and stuff like that. Um, yeah. That did improve it uh, quite a bit. Uh, I but think it, they could have cut it down to four and it would have yeah. been even better. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, it was, there was still, yeah, there was still some draws there. could have gone, but it was, it was actually not a, I enjoyed it. I really enjoyed it. This first time I'd seen it, and I, I really enjoyed it. Hey, how about you, Jimmy? I enjoyed it too. It gets better as it goes. Um, I mean, it it's it's okay to start out with, but it gets much more interesting in episode four, and episode three is more. It, it gets more interesting as it goes, and by episode four, it's really moving very fast mm-hmm. in terms of the end game. It there's a lot of stuff going on in episode four. Um, Interestingly, it's co-written by Henry Lincoln, who was one of the three authors of Holy Blood, Holy Grail, that Mm. they were Bajan, Lee, and Lincoln. Uh, We talked about Holy Blood, Holy Grail in episode 77 of uh, Jimmy Akin's Mysterious World. It later, of course, went on to be inspired or uh, to inspire or, in the opinion of Bajan, Lee, and Lincoln, rip off Holy Blood, Holy Grail, the Dan Brown's The Da Vinci Code. Um, but I would say that this is more entertaining than either Holy Blood, Holy Grail, or the Da Vinci Code, both of which I've read. <laughs> that that is not a high bar. So, no. so, but it's still good. I I enjoyed this one too. I 
I always love seeing Jamie running around, you know, blasting things and, and that sort of thing. And uh, he was particularly good at that. And this, I liked Zoe's first real adventure with the doctor. She looks like a fun companion, uh, a good match for the doctor and a good counterpoint to Jamie. You know, she's, mm -hmm. she's got that future, you know, intelligence, but also like the future knowledge she's from, from our future. Um, and so that creates this interesting balance between the man of the 18th century and the woman of the future century. I would forget which one. She's and, late, tw late 21st. Okay. And so, uh, yeah, I like that balance and the, the, you know, and the second doctors kind of got that, the comic, um, sometimes he's a little out of his depth element, and that's that's it's real. It's, it was a real fun story in that element. Um, yeah, the he, he's not strutting around telling people how he's going to dominate them and stuff. <laughs> yeah, that's right. That's right. So it it was nice, and uh, you know the stakes were a whole planet, but it wasn't the whole universe, and th that was that was good. Um, the dominators. I, I kind of found them kind of funny. We could talk more about the, why that is. <laughs> yeah. It's kind of amusing. Just me. Vi visually, if yeah. nothing else. But <laughs> when you take in their personalities, it's yeah. even funnier. Yeah. yeah, yeah. There was some like some very interesting stuff going on with them. So uh, overall, it was good. I, 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 I did like it. That was a good one. What, one thing I really like about Zoe, since you brought her up, is she's, she's so cheerful. Mm -hmm. I mean, she is put in threatening situations, but and she'll react appropriately when she's in, when she's being threatened. But she's very determined and very cheerful and just straight ahead, no nonsense. Let's yeah. do this business type yeah. companion. And and she'll she'll be an agent for herself. She's not gonna. Mm -hmm. She's not one of these you know wilting flowers that's gonna. Oh no, I need the doctor to save me. Oh no, she's like okay, let's do this. You know, she's right. planning with the other other prisoners to try to escape and try to, you know, help the doctor out and stuff like that. She's, I mean, she's not going to take any guff. Yeah. You know? Yeah. She's an awesome companion. She's a great counterpoint for Jamie and she's even better when she gets the cat suit. <laughs> <laughs> well, speaking of uh, costumes, you mentioned the, the, the Dulcian men wearing their uh, weird <laughs> <laughs> lampshade costumes. <laughs> yeah. They, it's like, are those window curtains? They've just, <laughs> Because they have this bunched up top, yeah. which they're wearing around the top of the window of what looks like curtains is around the middle of their chest. Mm -hmm. And it looks like they just went down to a drapery and, <laughs> and got a bunch of curtains and turned them into costumes. Yeah. And they're kind of like, kind of like togas too, where they're, they're, they're more, <laughs> more like a skirt at the bottom than, uh, than like yeah. shorts or something like that. They they also have different ones for women than men. The women, yeah. the Dulcians, have what are kind of skirts rather than curtains. So apparently, the bust line accentuating aspect of the <laughs> of the costumes is considered masculine on Dulcus. Yeah, so maybe perhaps the BBC censorship on that one. Yeah, <laughs> but yeah, the the poor the women are wearing like these these see through skirts with a leotard, whereas the guys are uh, in the and it's you know, it's almost like a kilt. And then you get Jamie and Cully going up and down the ladder in the bunker with the kilt yeah. on. I'm like, <laughs> I don't know how Scotsmen climb ladders, but I would not be looking up. Just don't look up. No, <laughs> it, it, it's also the even though the lower ranking Dulcian men have the ones that are have the curtains that are kind of like kilts mm. the the upper class council members have ones that are that go all the way to the floor so they've <laughs> got the floor length curtains <laughs> yeah floor length curtains um and then of course we speaking of costumes we, we've mentioned a few times the dominators have this weird high collar shoulder thing around their bulbous head and it kind of makes them look sort of like in some ways what what are those creatures from? Oh, uh, not Willow. What's the other one? The the, the Henson Muppet thing. This the mm. I keep wanting to say Sleek Stacks, but that's a whole different thing. But um, they, they get this you think like Dark Crystal or Dark Crystal, right? The creatures from the Dark Crystal with that they got a kind of this hunching forward look to them. Mm. I don't know. That's what the the image that came to mind when I first saw them, and it's and it's this kind of strange like I. I don't know, but but it, practically speaking, it's terrible because you can't see anything out of your peripheral vision. Yeah, <laughs> yeah it, their heads are basically embedded in their ginormous shoulders, and which are perfectly round. And it, I, I, I kept being distracted. By, I mean, not only does it look comical, but I kept being distracted by, oh, and they also have their, for, for their costumes, they're wearing what in Morris dancing are known as tatters. 
Um, there, it's where you have this these overlapping rectangular pieces of cloth that look kind of that stick out, and they look mm-hmm. kind of like feathers. But because they're normally ripped out of a piece of cloth, they're called tatters. However, theirs seem to be made out of rubber. So yeah, right. they, I'm, it looks like they redressed some wetsuits or something. <laughs> but it, it, I just kept being distracted by the shoulders. And it's yeah. like, is his head supposed to be part of his shoulders? Or is, it, or is this meant to be like a shoulder pad on yeah. a costume? In reality, of course, it is shoulder padding. But what is it meant to be? Is it meant to convey that he's got these ginormous perfectly round shoulders under that fabric and his head is embedded in it or what see that's that's i i saw it as i just saw it as shoulder and neck protection and because you see zoom it you know close-ups and you can see that obviously the the real neck is inside the padding yeah so i mean i i yeah i, I just i just figured you know they're they're military you know they're they're you know they're they're obviously worried about combat and stuff like that so that's that's just shoulder protection it just looks bizarre it really looks <laughs> I, I, I guess since they fancy themselves the dominators, they've got the the biggest epaulets in the world. <laughs> right. They yeah. kind of remind me of early Suntarans in that sense. Mm-hmm. You know that that so, they they're a warrior race. They have these intimidating, mm-hmm. supposedly costumes, that sort of thing. Yeah, we won't get the Suntarans until the next Doctor, the third Doctor. Yep. Right. So we have this world of the Dulc the uh, Dulcians on uh, Dulcus. Uh, the, the dominators have come to conquer them because there's a particular resource we, they want, which we'll find out later is uh, radiation. And um, there's this island that is on the planet that has uh, intense radiation. And apparently they did atomic testing there. Um, One even, atomic test 172 right. years ago. And I, th- I thought it was interesting the way they described it because they said we'd given up war and aggression and weapons you know, ages ago, but when we were doing research for atomic energy, we discovered that this potential use uh, for explosives, so we decided to test it, <laughs> which I thought was interesting. They never intended to use it, so they say, for, nu- for nuclear weapons or atomic weapons, but they decided to just test it out on an island, and it's become this, this you know, this uh, radiated island, and now it's a sort of it's, it's educational. A, it's a, yeah, it's a war museum, and they also use as part of that they use it as a warning to future generations. Mm-hmm. So they bring school kids here to see the horrors of what nuclear weaponry could do. Right, right. See, I, I took it that the, it was the nuclear test that led them to say we don't want war anymore. That they mm-hmm. looked at the destructive capability of this weapon that they developed because they even sounded like they they said that they stopped all atomic power. Uh, research as well. They went a different way for their energy purposes. Yeah, I wonder. Yeah, I, I'm not sure. Yeah, I, I mean, well, I'd have to go, uh, you know, read through the transcript again of the of the script uh, to see exactly what what they said. But I got the sense of the of the other way. But yeah, but either way, you know, in the past 172 years, this island has existed as this warning but you know uh, academics uh, or go there and do research but they also said they take school groups to mm-hmm. to see it um which is that's that's a interesting field trip <laughs> imagine you go to the <laughs> bikini atoll <laughs> oh, as a school and, group <laughs> and they have the irradiated war victim dummies to show the school children yeah <laughs> <laughs> you know, that is horrifying um but it, then and then we have this group of dulcians in this vessel Hippies. yeah well, yeah. and so you have this stereotype of the idle and indulgent peoples in search of excitement to divert them from their boredom because life has become so boring. It's there was a common can't, trope in the sixties sci-fi. Can't, e- can't even be bothered to get a permit to go to the island, right? Um, and of course, one of them is the son of the high counselor or you know president or equivalent. The coyote is, yeah, the guy who's <laughs> smuggling them onto the island, <laughs> right, right. Uh, and so, but when they get there, they discover that the island's all the radiation is gone because the dominators, when they land their ship, they apparently their their just their fuel source is radiation, and they're just basically going from planet to planet, 
with just enough fuel to get there, or or at mm. least in this case, and this it, is an advanced party. A motive, gives them a motive to dominate people and take their radiation. Yep. Right, and so they've sucked up all the radiation on the island, and so when they when these these people crash on the island, uh, they're not even sure they're in the right place because there's no radiation there. Um, so, and and for quite a while through this, and then very early, most of that party of people is killed, and there's all only one them, survivor. All yeah. of them except the official son, Cully. Yeah, everyone else yep. they just waste them. Yeah, that was pretty. I was I was a little surprised by the how quickly they killed off those people. Um, this is a pretty bloodthirsty episode. <laughs> yeah. So now Cully, yeah. uh, he actually he shows up in the the actor shows up in Doctor Who much later, uh, for a very small part. Uh, he, the actor was uh, Arthur Cox, who was in the eleventh hour, of the first uh, Matt Smith episode. He was the guy whose car that uh, Amy threw the tie. But yeah. <laughs> Mr. Henderson was his name. Oh, funny. It's funny to see him come back in that. That's awesome. One of the things that's interesting about this is, um, so this episode of Doctor Who was made in the mid-1960s. And in this period of the show, the BBC was not nearly as progressive as it is now. And so today it's just woke and you have all this woke virtue signaling in the show. Mm -hmm. Back then you could have what, what some would consider reactionary episodes with a conservative message. And that's essentially what this show is because um, even though the Dominators are bad guys, a key story element is the Doctor and companions must convince the Dulcians to go along with the use of force in order to defeat their enemies. And so even though, if you think about it fundamentally, this serial is, okay, pacifism it may be an attractive ideal, but it's ultimately foolish. There are situations where you can't just negotiate and talk your way out of a situation. You must respond with force. Which, you know, for being something only about 20 years after World War II was, you know, on people's minds. And you had conservatives at the BBC who would sometimes write in messages with this more conservative slant on things, which frankly I find refreshing because I don't like politics to all go in one direction. If you're going to explore one side of the spectrum, you should explore the other as well. Um, but also, I happen to agree with the message of this show. Mm -hmm. By all means, try to talk and negotiate and solve things that way, but be prepared that you may have to use force because there are right. situations where it's warranted. Basically, pacifism is a luxury. I don't want to, what's the best word to use? Parasite is not the one I want because it's insulting. <laughs> um, but it's basically a luxury for those who are dependent on someone else to protect them. Right. right. Yes, that is a good way to put it. Yeah, I, I thought it was um, interesting because at the time period this was produced, you know, the hippie movement, mm -hmm. you know, the, the peace movements, the, the, the reaction against wars, we had the Cold War. And so this would have been a reaction to all of that going on in society at the time. Uh, yeah, it's interesting to see that counterpoint. It's, we're not used to seeing that anymore. Mm -hmm. uh, I, so the doctor and Zoe and, and uh, Jamie kind of show up relatively late in that first episode. A lot happens before they get there. And when they arrive, the doctor's talking about like they're on vacation. You know, the, the doctor's always trying to go on vacation and anything <laughs> someplace, someplace bad. And, uh, you know, oh, Dulcus is, you know, peaceful and pleasant. And I'm like, but you were landing on the, the one irradiated part of this entire planet. Well, he, he didn't know that. This is in the <laughs> era where the doctor is not really in control of where the TARDIS goes. <laughs> right. Yep. Um, incidentally, he says he's been here before and he didn't, it was, he loved it so much he didn't want to leave. If you think about, well, when would that have been? Because the, he's still fairly new as the second doctor. This is the second season of second doctor episodes. And he, in this era, the stories all blend into each other. You know, there's mm -hmm. like no gap. Now, Big Finish just kind of retconned that. But in the way it's presented on television, there is no gap between stories. It's just each one, the, the, the stinger of each story leads into the, the teaser of the next. Mm -hmm. And so if he's been to Dulcus before, 
that would have presumably either been when he was traveling with Susan before he met Ian and Barbara, or before he left Gallifrey altogether on some kind of field trip from Gallifrey. Mm. Right. Was there, did he also make a similar reference with the Yetis that he had uh, that been to Earth recall. before? Mm-mm. Okay. I, I, I had something that where he talked about having encountered uh, you know, the, the Himalayans before, but mm-hmm. there's a couple of interesting elements in, of time, timey-wiminess in that, that story that we'd already talked about. You know, the Dulcians are very interesting in their attitudes about alien life, about facts mm-hmm. and truth. Um, mm-hmm. You know, when, when the doctor encounters this, this professor, we'll call him, uh, and, the, um, and his two students, they, they pretty quickly accept the fact that, he, that they're aliens. Balin. Balin is the guy's name. Yep. Yeah. Right. Yeah, they're very nonchalant about um, about the meeting actual aliens, even though we're told later that someone in their society disproved the existence of aliens. It's like, yeah, but here, mm-hmm. the, here are some people claiming to be aliens, so they and they look just like us, so they must be aliens. <laughs> <laughs> right? Yeah. The one, stu- the male student, Kando, says, "No, no, ta- no, no, no." Kando is the woman, which is fascinating yep. Yep. Oh, that she right. has this ma- in in. In Indo-European languages, O is a masculine suffix. You would expect her as a female to be named Kanda, but she's not. She's named Kando. Right, right. That's what threw me there. Uh, She says, we're taught to accept facts, being foolish to contemplate fantasy in the face of reality. You are here. This is fact. That you come from another planet, I accept because I have no other means of proving it. (laughs) It's like... Mm. That doesn't seem to be a very good way. That's like a bent version of the argument from silence. Yeah, and uh, later on, um, Balin says something along the lines of, um, well, when they're talking about the radiation being gone, he says, well, since the radiation disappeared after 172 years, that must mean the atomic blast radiation lasts for 172 years. It's a fact. It must be true. Uh, Dude, have you ever heard of a half-life? That's not how radiation works. (laughs) Right. I mean, it ignores the concepts of, like, First principles and theory and rationality. He says, Scientific um, method. Yeah, he says it seems pointless to spend time searching for reasons to prove facts. A fact is a truth. Uh, so, wow, you've, your whole civilization is built on non explanatory science. How interesting. You're going to go far with that. Mm. <laughs> yeah, mm. It's like the, this truthiness. What was that? Uh, the, the Colbert mm-hmm. thing? Yeah. Oh, yeah. It has truthiness. It, yeah, it's funny. It, it doesn't really hold together, but it is a nice attempt on the writer's part to show people who, who react differently than, than human beings on Earth yep. would. And who are open minded and you know it, it's it it's they're also trying to and this is fairly subtle because uh, we know that that uh Balin is wrong, that it's not that the radiation just vanishes instantly after one hundred and seventy two years. So what they're trying to do is showing us people who think differently, and also that thinking differently doesn't always mean you're right. Mm-hmm. They're, they they yes. can make mistakes in reasoning, just like because that's clearly what Balin is doing. Well, at the same time, too, is you know he's accepting the truth that this radiation has disappeared, mm-hmm. but he's not willing to accept the evidence that the reason why it disappeared is because this giant spaceship that just landed on the planet with aliens on it. It, right. it wasn't until they finally basically drug him out there to see it that he was able to say, "Okay, this actually is a thing." Right, because he's presented with a fact that mm-hmm. that uh, he has that to he can't deny. Trip. Yeah, right. So, also, the way that the the ship vacuums up the um, radiation, which we never see, we're only told it's been done. Yeah, um, is it, that itself? You know, it's like okay, was there a giant windstorm on the island? Was there were there hurricane force winds that it sucked it up all that dust so quickly? Mm-hmm. So they yeah. never really cover that, but you know, whatever. Yep. Some, some hand wavy way that they collected it. Um, so the doctor and Jamie get captured by the dominators. Their names are Toba and I want to say Regu, but I think it's Ro- Roga. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah. Rago. Rago, Rago, not Regu. Rago and Toba. And, um, 
they're, they're so they're captured by them, and the doc they they, they want to test them because they want to see if the Dulcians would make an uh, acceptable slave uh, labor population. Force. Yeah, yep. and the doctor intentionally fails the intelligence tests. He doesn't want them to know how smart he is, which in fact is kind of clever. <laughs> so mm -hmm. so they underestimate him. They end up letting them go, which I thought was interesting. They're just like, well, we have no use for you. They're also not that impressed with Jamie's physique. Um, they conclude immediately Jamie is stupid, although his brain shows signs of a lot of recent learning, which is obviously his travels with the doctor. Um, but they think of him as stupid. And later in, in like episode, uh, episode five, uh, probationer Toba is like, where is the other stupid one, meaning Jamie? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, but they're not that impressed with his physique. They they conclude his skeleton is brittle, but he has some muscular force, and he's so he is flexible and has some muscular force. Yeah. yeah, they're much more impressed by Zoe, who apparently they think of as the strongest of the workers uh, among the 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 Dulcians and her when they put them to work. Mm -hmm. But she they don't examine her, so they don't know that she's just like Jamie. She's yeah similar. Um, it is interesting though, that the dominators, you know, for the fact that they like to dominate and they like to, you know, destroy planets and stuff, they're not indiscriminate and they're killing either though, you know, cause to Toba gets reamed out several times for, for just, yeah. why did you waste Toba's energy on just word. killing? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 <laughs> the, the, it's interesting. We have this clash of personalities between the two dominators. So mm. navigator R Rago is is in charge and probationer Toba is like his second in command or something. And his, mm -hmm. frankly, his only in command because um, there's just the two of them. And then they both dominate their quarks, but there's a very, they have very different personalities. I mean, they're both dominators. They're both really into dominating things, but they have totally different approaches to how they want to dominate stuff. Probationer Toba is all about destroying things, you know, and Navigator Rago is all about ignoring things unless they're a threat. It's like, if it's not a threat to you, don't waste your time on it. Don't yeah. waste your resources on it. Don't waste the quark's power on it, you know, trying to chase yep. it and capture it and destroy it. It's not worth the hassle. Stick to, stick to the mission. And so... Rago, the guy in charge you would normally expect to be the blackest villain, is actually much more reasonable. Mm -hmm. He, if you're not a threat to him, he really doesn't care. Um, and whereas it's the junior guy who is obsessed with wanting to destroy, uh, you know, everybody, and also can never remember his orders because <laughs> it's like he will, he he, he will. He will instantly forget as soon as there's any threat to him or one of the quarks. He completely forgets his orders and starts giving orders to destroy, even <laughs> though he's previously accepted that we're not going to do that. Remember? That's Just the slightest a provocation. A few yeah. minutes ago. Finally, by episode six, for once he remembers when, yes. when, when things are crucial. And there's a threat. He starts to order the Dominators to destroy again. And he says, Domi he says, Quarks, wait. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Resume drilling. <laughs> Resume drilling. He backs down and, yeah. and, 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 and implements the orders he was given. So he, he, was, he was called, you know, probationer Toga. Mm. I, there he goes. I knew I was going to do it. Toba. Toba. Um, <laughs> Be, so either he was a young officer, you know, like a new mm -hmm. officer, or he's a really bad officer, and that's why he's on probation. <laughs> he's but either scrub. way. <laughs> well, yeah. Rego is right in the sense of, from his point of view, they're going to be destroying this planet anyway. So why chase them around the, the island trying to destroy them? They're all going to, like from Rego's point of view, they're all going to, all these people on the island are going to die anyway. So why are we chasing them around using up our resources? Yeah, that's ultimately revealed, although it's not established from the beginning that all of the Delcians will die because yeah. they are thinking about using some of them as slaves. But eventually they get a report from fleet command saying, nah, these people aren't worth it. 
they the dominators do make a really dumb deduction at one point because they they take the doctor and jamie to the war museum where there are some weapons mm. and they they know that these weapons are advanced weapons and they're like how does this work the, to the doctor i don't know and they conclude that how could advanced weapons be made by by these by the Delsians? because these people are such simpletons and it's like are you judging the entire planet by the two random nobodies like if I grabbed yeah. two random people off the street and asked them how a nuclear bomb worked, they wouldn't be able to tell me. That doesn't mean uh, that people of this planet haven't figured out how to build nuclear bombs. It's kind of that was kind of a dumb deduction. Yeah, well, and, and then you hand them an advanced weapon that they can then turn on you. <laughs> yeah. How does this work? <laughs> well, let me show you. Yeah, it it yeah. Also, remember the number one rule in gun shops and everywhere else. Yeah. Never point a weapon in the direction of anything unless you intend to fire on it. Right. Exactly. Every weapon is loaded. Uh, yep. Yeah. And even, I think they had uh, firearms at uh, Culloden, right? So uh, the Jimmy should know that too. Uh, yeah. yeah he's, they just wanted to point weapons at things and fire at a lot of them, though. <laughs> yeah. yeah. That's, that's true. Uh, oh, that reminds me. I was going to, yeah. one of the things that I find fascinating about Jamie is because he is Scottish, so he's from Great Britain, but he is most definitely not English. And this is an English show. You mm -hmm. know, it's made by the, it's made down in London. It's very England centric, even though it includes people from other parts of Great Britain. And I was just thinking about the, um, it's not the same, but having Jamie talking to Cully about how, you know, his clan really sorted out the Redcoats. Is like yep. okay for most of the people in the audience, their ancestors were on the side of the redcoats. <laughs> so yeah. this is a little bit like in America. It's not quite the same because of the slavery issue, but it's a little bit like having Jamie be a Confederate soldier and talk about how yeah. he and his gang were sorting out Yankees. That's and that true. would have been Scottish pride to hear him say that. Yeah, mm -hmm. I did like you know Warrior Jamie running about you know doing his thing because that's Jamie was a was a yeah. warrior in the in you know scottish independence uh so yeah that was that that's, was a nice where, thing to see that's where i like where he was he was running around you know attacking the the quarks and they're they're the uh dominators are trying to get the doctor to tell him where he's at and the answer of course is he's out doing guerrilla warfare against you <laughs> yeah hit and run <laughs> right right uh, he he would he would have uh been very familiar with running through the highlands and <laughs> throwing things at the at uh, enemy soldiers Oh, by the way, one thing I like that technologically speaking in this is the Dominators have a a neat um oh also notice by the way the quarks are not as dumb as the Chumblies were in yeah. the recent first doctor story. They they have some intelligence of their own. But uh, I was going to say the Dominators have a piece of technology that I think is really nice where they use molecular force to suck people onto the wall and hold them there. And, okay, so actually the force that makes molecules is electromagnetism. So this you could just say electromagnetism, but this is 1960s British children's television. The writers probably don't understand how molecules work. <laughs> but, that sounds cool. <laughs> but yeah. it's still nice to just like zoop and you're stuck to the wall. <laughs> <laughs> that was, yeah, I did like that. That was a good one. Uh, so the Delcians, uh, the high council, Zoe and Cully go to their high council to kind of get them to act. I'm not sure what they thought they were going to do, mm. but the, the, the Delcians are very passive. They're like, eh, haste is not in the Delcian tradition. Better to do nothing than to do the wrong thing. And I'm like, that is the terrible philosophy. <laughs> <laughs> Better to I do don't know. Maybe, but, maybe I could do that as pastor. I could say, you know, I'm not going to do anything because I'd rather not do the wrong thing. Yeah. Now that I think about it, maybe we get Congress to to take that. No, I don't want yeah, to get the ball. Yeah, nice. <laughs> <laughs> Better to do nothing than the wrong thing. Um, yeah, they definitely yeah. have a don't just do something, stand there view. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, right. Well, um, it's, it's kind of a stereotypical um, Garden of Eden, philosopher, round table type. Thing that they had going on there where it's just we're gonna sit there and discuss things to death right in fact they like they have the the perfect society everything is peaceful and you know there's no there's no negative things um i like how 
the when they're talking about so how do, the council is talking about so how do we want to deal with this crisis? They have a minute. They, this is some nice thought on the part of the writers. They have a guy who they have to summon, who's like the head of their emergency department, mm-hmm. and they're touting his past successes in dealing with fires and floods and volcanic eruptions and stuff like that. So it's not like they live in a perfect Garden of Eden. There are disasters that happen on Dulcus, and they have to deal with them. And they've got someone who does that and who's apparently quite good at his job. But they immediately, one of them, counselors, immediately points out, yeah, but none of those are man-made. So how is he qualified to help us with someone (laughs) threatening to create a disaster? Right. At one point, Zoe and Balin are having a debate and Zoe's you know we have to fight and Balin's no we have to let let him be and Balin says resistance will lead to violence and so he says submission leads to slavery and she's yep. right <laughs> so yeah that's more of that that pacifism and, and, and I was gonna say and yeah resistance leads to violence that's kind of the point we want to commit violence against them so that they right. go away right violence is not necessarily in and of itself a bad thing when you're defending the weak and the innocent against aggression. So they, the uh, dominators put uh, Zoe and Balin and Kando and Teal. Teal. Yeah. Teal Teal. is the, is the the male university student. Right. They put them to work to kind of see, work them to exhaustion, see how long they can work. This is why they were still figuring out whether they would be good slave labor. Um, and so they're, they're just lifting rocks and carrying them around, uh, for, for a lot of the time. Um, and, uh, and the council, meanwhile, figures out that their only choices are to fight, run, or submit. And they can't fight or, and they or, can't run. Or wait. Or, or wait, which is yeah. essentially what they decide to do. Um, so let's talk about the quarks. The quarks are interesting little robots. There mm-hmm. is this, this period of time in, BB, in the Doctor Who where all robotic devices have these really hard to understand robotic voices. Uh, yeah. They do it with a the Cyberman. They do it with the Quarks. They've done it with several others. But a voice is apparently was all the voices of the Quarks were done by this woman doing a childlike voice. Mm-hmm. And their stature was pretty small. In fact, they, they had child actors inside the mm-hmm. Quark outfits, apparently, from a local uh, acting academy. And so they're almost childlike. and. They look kind of non-threatening. They don't look obviously like, you know, scary robots. So it's kind of interesting contrast here with, you would say, Cybermen or yeah. Daleks. They they don't talk about it on the TARDIS wiki page, but it we have in early Doctor Who a series after the success of the Daleks, which were insanely popular. It was called Dalek Mania. You know, people just loved the Daleks. Terry Nation, the creator of the Daleks, had hopes of creating a show just about the Daleks with no Doctor Who in it. Mm. And um, so they were insanely popular. And you have in in this first and second Doctor's time, the introduction of a whole bunch of new robotic-like creatures, like the Chumleys and the Quarks, and there are others yet. And the impression I've always had is that the this was writers and possibly BBC executives mm-hmm. hoping to come up with something that was as successful as the Daleks, or at least on the same order as the Daleks in terms of success. And that would, right. um, you know, b- bring a lot of attention to the show, it would bring a lot of viewers to the show. And it would possibly let them dispense with Terry Nation and all of his demands. Yep. But nobody ever came up with a Dalek killer in that sense. Yeah. I, I, I almost wonder if, if even this, this episode was meant to be a spinoff of a recurring enemy that just never recurred. Well, didn't recur on television, but did recur in, um, in, in auxiliary media. Okay. Uh, both the Dominators and especially the Quarks. The Quarks did go on to have success as a solo villain without the Dominators. Mm. Interesting. Interesting. Not in, like on, the, in not comics and things like that. Right. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, they were, they're 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 typical robots of the time. They're slow moving. They're kind of easy easy uh, targets. They've yeah. got the dumbest arms. <laughs> yes. Their their arms like fold out of slots in their chest. Yeah, right. And it's like, okay, obviously your ancestors didn't grow up swinging, swinging from trees. <laughs> yeah. 
Well, with the with the dominators, uh, you know, big shoulders, maybe they don't, so they can't move their arms around like we can either. Yeah. Well, <laughs> well, that's true. Maybe, yeah. they're, maybe, <laughs> maybe they're anthropomorphic for the dominator species. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> They also have, they're badly designed as robots. Now, this, again, you could say it's because of the Dominators. They can't turn their heads. Yeah. Um, but the uh, the Quark's heads have, they're spherical, and they've got little, what look like tubes or um, washers stuck to the outside of their head. And then they have these projections that are sort of, like long triangle, long pyramid type things. They got one on the top of the head, two where the ears go, one where the nose go, and one at the back of the head. And you're thinking those are sensory devices. Mm -hmm. You know, that's it's it's got this thing has 360 vision based on the way it's designed. But no, you can sneak up behind <laughs> a quark and it will not detect you. Yep. So as happened several times in 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 episodes five and six alone. Yeah. Um, so these are badly designed in that they can't see behind them, even though right. it looks like it's got what's a sensory apparatus right there. Yeah, yeah Jamie does get the drop on them quite a bit. <laughs> yeah, and the doctor sneaks up right behind one and puts the seed device back on the Dominator ship. That's right, yep. that's right. Uh, so we, like I mentioned, there's a lot of a lot of dying that goes on here. So Balin eventually dies at Toba's hand because he won't mm -hmm. give up Jamie. So it's a bit of a heroic dress. Uh, Teal also dies. Um, I don't remember when that happened though. I I must have got distracted when that was going on. I don't think Teal dies. No. Um, oh, I thought he's, he did. The doctor he orders her, him and Kando to head back and Cully right. to head back to the shuttle to take off from the island. The other guy who dies is oh. Tensa. Tensa is the emergency minister, oh. and and he has this rant about please show respect to the head of the council, even though he's not the head of the council. He's he's ranting to uh, Navigator Rago about you know please don't be so dominating. Please show a little bit of respect yeah. and make requests instead of demands. And so um, Rago wastes him, mm -hmm. um, but he's the other one who dies. Okay, that's why I, I got mixed up. I must have uh, mis mis Tensa and, and and Teal were very yep. similar. Um, so uh, yeah, so the the plot is to just is to drop this uh, seed, which is a very small atomic device, in through the the mantle of the planet, um, explode, create a super volcano, and irradiate the entire planet, which then will be enough fuel for the uh, the the whole fleet. Yeah, the science here is kind of wonky because they've they've told us that the magma is not radioactive. Well, then mm -hmm. why will detonating this device make it radioactive? Is if the device itself irradiates, you've already got your fuel in that little in that little egg. You yeah. don't you don't need to irradiate any magma. You can just you can just use what's already there. Yeah, it's weird. Like it like somehow the magma was going to expand the amount of. <laughs> Uh, radiation yeah. in it, yeah. And and they had to blow up the entire planet to do it, basically. Yeah. That, and then they can scoop it, cut, sweep, swoop in and scoop up all the radiation from the debris of the planet. Yeah. We should make it clear, it's not just their own ship they're trying to power. There's a whole fleet of these ships up mm -hmm. in orbit or yeah. in the solar system, and they're trying to get power for all of them. So we didn't mention that there's a, there's a fallout bunker underneath the War Museum. That's where where they uh, that uh, Jamie right. and Cully first were holed up in, and then later on the Doctor and the other Dulcians on the island as well. And while they're hiding in there, this is when they figured out the plan. And Jamie is the one who comes up with the idea for how to stop this dastardly plan because the drill spot for the sea that's going to be dropped is right outside the War Museum. And so Jamie says, "Well, why don't we dig a side tunnel to intercept their?" borehole and just catch the egg when they drop it which is an interesting idea um it seems somewhat impossible but but at first the doctor kind of dismisses jamie as he's trying to explain his idea which i thought was funny mm -hmm. well and, and All rago rago literally takes the ball and drops it you know, <laughs> yeah. takes this egg-shaped part of the uh, atomic seed and just drops it i mean it's not like it's being forced down just let gravity do its thing yeah 
Also, when they go to dig the tunnel, Jamie initially grabs his knife, his dirk, and starts like stabbing the wall with it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and the doctor is like, no, 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 stand aside, let me. And Jamie is like, you're not going to get us through that wall with your sonic screwdriver. <laughs> Which has only recently been introduced. It was mm -hmm. just introduced in the time of Victoria, uh, just a few episodes ago. And yep. all it's all it's uh, all that's ever happened with it is he's used it to do as like a screwdriver to unscrew bolts and things, which is actually you use a wrench to do that, but close enough. <laughs> yeah. And and he's like stand back, and he starts. He says it's a little more than a sonic screwdriver. And so this is the turning point where the sonic screwdriver starts to become a magic wand yep. that can do basically anything. Because here, it turns into a laser blowtorch. And <laughs> yeah. he's just like, he's just like totally burning through this wall in order mm. to get to the dirt behind it. And then after he's got a big circular chunk of uh, roughly circular chunk of wall out of the way, they then can start scooping out the dirt to get to the tunnel, to get to the borehole. We mentioned earlier that uh, the doctor arms Jamie and Cully with a series of explosives that the doctor from a medical kit. <laughs> I was going to yeah. say he, he devises them from just two, a couple different kinds of medicines. I'm like, what kind of medicines are in that kit? Well, <laughs> was, was this the creation of Nitro Nine? Because he he said to drop the number nine pill into this medicine oh, capsule. So did the right. doctor actually create Nitro Nine? <laughs> that could be. That could be. Because uh, nitroglycerin could be a part of a medical. Uh, emergency medical kit. For it's a, it's used for treating heart ailments. That's so true. there you go. You <laughs> they, got nitroglycerin and the number nine pill, nitro nine. That yeah. I, I would, I'll buy that. I'll buy that. <laughs> there, there are at least three medicines in there though, because the doctor is, is working one. He has Zoe pounding another into little bitty, you know, particles. Yep. He combines those two. And then he has the third thing, which is the pill, mm. which he tells Jamie to put in the bottle bef and then throw it within 10 seconds. Yep. I like the scene where he's talking about like to put to, you know throw put it in and he drops one in closes and says now you only have ten seconds and then you hear Zoe six five yeah. four <laughs> six seven like, no six seven yeah, eight yeah nine, she's eight, like throws it. paying attention he's like oh and he <laughs> throws it <and> explodes <laughs> that was that was good good for Zoe uh, so you we mentioned that the doctor. You know, they intercept the seed, but he realizes it's sealed. There's no way to defuse the bomb that it is. He, and he's he doesn't know how to crack an egg, being from <laughs> Gallifrey. <laughs> That's right. So he uh, he comes up with the plan to, to stuff it back on the Dominator ship as it takes off, which is, you know, fairly, you know, like you said, bloodthirsty of the mm. doctor. It's pretty cold. He's, he seems he has no compunction about blowing up the uh, these two Dominators on this ship, um, which presumably is what convinces the rest of the dominator fleet not yeah, to bother they don't really deal with the so one of the dominator ships has just been destroyed the that would signify a threat dominators respond to threats yeah. so why doesn't another dominator ship come down <laughs> exactly so uh, uh, they're yeah, so maybe... low on power they're like it's not worth it <laughs> yeah, well, that's the other thing is they said they were so low on power, so maybe they, they just don't have the power to do it. Um, so, and that's when the doctor's like, well, now another day's uh, work is done. We can relax. And Jamie's like, uh, doctor, don't forget, even though we're not creating a super volcano, this island is becoming a volcano. Oh, right. And then we have some nice stock photos of uh, lava running everywhere. So yep. that was, or video, yeah. stock video. Um so, and uh, that's where it ends. And as you said, Jimmy, this is going to lead right into the next episode. The mind, uh, the next story, The Mind Robber. Yeah. Okay. All right. Which is, wow. Next Second Doctor story is going to be wild. <laughs> okay. Really that. wild. <laughs> Actually, right. probably the most wild story of Doctor Who of all time in, ter oh. in, in terms of high concept. Interesting, interesting. And this is another one that exists completely, so. Oh, mm -hmm. good. Yeah, and this is the the sixth season overall of Doctor Who, the and the so the the very beginning of the this the story of the Dominators. And so it means that uh, we're heading toward the end of the second Doctor's mm -hmm. this is his last season. So, uh we've already talked about War Games at the Oh, I guess uh, this is his third season. Yeah. Yeah, third. Yeah. Well, but yeah, they started midway through a season. 
So, um, yeah, so we're wrapping up the second Doctor here with uh, with several stories before we get to the, get to the war games. The um, uh, one thing, so I won't give away the fundamental high concept behind the war, behind the mind robber, but um, just to give you an illustration, because of the rules of how the next story works, Fraser Hines gets turned into his cousin at one point because the Doctor makes a mistake rearranging his face. <laughs> oh wow okay <laughs> that'll be interesting so it's still jamie yeah. but now it's played by fraser hines cousin uh, so um any any final thoughts on this one though father Corey? so i had to laugh that the all the count the chairs there in the council council chambers you remember when uh airports and bus stations had the tvs tv chairs where you could yeah. plunk a quarter and watch tv for five minutes that's what they had <laughs> right all that's their right. chairs had little tvs next to them so they had the little tv chairs from back in the 70s and that era that's funny jimmy this story also marks uh the introduction of jelly babies into doctor who mm. they don't make a big deal out of it but when jamie and the doctor are traveling in one of the travel capsules the doctor whips out a bag of jelly babies and starts eating them that's right that's right oh, i missed that um all right, so we did promise some listener feedback, so we'll get started with that. And we have our feedback. Most of it comes from our recent discussion of the Sixth Doctor Big Finish stories, The Last mm -hmm. Adventure. Uh, and in the in one of those, we talked about the possibility of a spinoff uh, from Doctor Who in the current era on Disney+. Plus. Uh, concerning Unit. So this comes from Mark Gillies, 1970, via YouTube who writes, I'm really interested in a good unit show. They've become nothing but joke red shirts in New Who. One thing that's always bothered me about the Doctor is that humanity is so pitiful that we would all be gone if it wasn't for the aristocratic Time Lord who slums to save us. I would like to see humanity prove to be competent once in a while and save ourselves. Interesting. Well, yeah, well, they've. Th I don't know that I would agree that Unit has always been just red shirts in New Who because they have there have been um, situations where they they were kind of on top of things, it, particularly in the Twelfth Doctor's time mm -hmm. it, with Peter Capaldi. Um, for example, there is uh, there is one point where. Uh, Kate Stewart basically drugs and kidnaps the twelfth Doctor. You yeah, know? and it's like, okay, dude, we've prepared for this. You're not, you're, you, we're not letting you just do what you want. You are working for us now, and you're gonna help fix this. And it's like she is in charge. Mm -hmm. Um, so, and they also in the Dark Water sequence, they provide him. Uh, although I hate it. Um, they provide him with the pres. You're the you're like the president of Earth now, which is completely ridiculous. Yeah, mm -hmm. and uh, in the current geopolitical climate, um, and here's your presidential plane, and it's your flying fortress, and blah blah blah, and um, they provide him with the resources, you know, that are mm -hmm. being used to execute the plot. So I don't know that I'd consider them just red shirts. I would say they have not been treated in the same way that they were in the third doctor's time because there they were integral parts of every story they were but they were the companions mm -hmm. at the yeah. time and and these days because of the way the show is structured they're not they haven't become regular companions so they don't get regular companion treatment they just get drive by guest star ally status Right. Um but uh but it you know I I agree they're they're not what they haven't been treated the it, recently the way they were originally. Yeah. You know I, 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 yeah. I I will I will agree with with his statement though when it comes especially during the David Tennant era. Of course that was David Tennant when Ed is most you know that was the doctor's most dismissive of humans mm -hmm. in general. Um which is so funny that he's he was such a popular doctor but he was humans he was were a just jerk. You, Yeah, he was <laughs> the humans were barely above apes as far as he was concerned i think he preferred the apes over the humans sometimes yeah. and so unit did get very much um short shrift and were you know mocked and derided as he was using them anyways you know he would use unit as he's insulting them you know mm -hmm. and it was which it was the it, doctor also kind of did he yeah. kind of did but he wasn't as much of a jerk about it as as david Tennant was and so yeah no i, I agree with that at least when unit was first reintroduced in new who yeah it was a 
it was at best a red shirt, you know, doctor mocks him and they die for him anyways, type of thing. And then eventually, yeah, as, as Jimmy said, they, they did kind of rehabilitate them and give them more agency. And we can see that even with the, um, the 13th doctor, uh, special where unit played a yeah. fairly key part in the, the episode. So, uh, mm-hmm. that, that, that really is a redemption. So I, I agree. I'd like to see unit as on its own, you know, and as, mm-hmm. as a, uh, as a, a force that could be uh, cheered for really. But yeah. uh, again, it would be how they portray it. We'd have to see. Yeah. I also want to say, and we kind of had something like that with Torchwood. I mean, I never watched Torchwood, but it was a human run institution that did fight off alien threats. And mm. they could certainly do a similar series about unit. I definitely agree. I don't like the whole strutting doctor thing that is really part of new who you you really even even tom baker who is the weirdest and most egocentric of the well i tom and colin baker Mm -hmm. (laughs) with with the possible exception of those two guys you really didn't have the kind of strutting doctor thing that you do now um, yep. where 9, 10, 11, and 12 all um, had moments where they're just ragging on humanity and dissing it and talking about how superior they are. And I hate that. I think that's terrible writing. I don't like it. I don't think it makes the Doctor attractive. One thing I will give to Chris Chibnall in the Jodie Whittaker era, you didn't have those kind of moments. Mm-mm. I mean, maybe mm-hmm. there was one here or there, but you, the 13th Doctor did not strut around being all superior. She would strut around and lecture people, oh, yeah. but yeah. that's not the same. It's not the same thing as I'm just intrinsically so superior to all of you. <laughs> right. mm. um, so our next feedback comes from Janelle via email who writes, I just started your podcast a little while ago. Welcome, Janelle. Oh. Yeah. And and jumped ahead when I noticed you were covering The Last Adventure. I've really loved your coverage and happy to see that you've been generally enjoying the set. I would just love to share some of my thoughts. Mainly, it's not just the Doctor's dark side the Villiard feasts on. Almost everyone in the universe gets that wrong. As the Doctor says in Stage Fright, negative emotions like anger can be born of compassion. What the Villiard feeds on is a combination of the Doctor's righteous fury and his barely contained, constrained ego. And this is ultimately because the Villiard represents a future version of the Doctor so broken by his failures that he casts aside his morality. A time when the pains of holding on to compassion are too great to bear and his ego completely takes over, which is exactly what we saw for a fleeting moment in The Tenth Doctor with Time Lord Victorious. So the Villiard isn't so much as an evil Doctor, for that I would suggest listening to Full Fathom 5, as a broken one. As you mentioned in this set alone, he is still capable of good. He didn't le- have to save the Red House Wolves, and he easily could have hijacked the Master's plan to take over the multiverse, but didn't. He is, however, needlessly cruel in his plan to lure the Doctor in stage fright, which does show that he's very willing to be evil. But I do not believe he is as evil to his core as someone like the Master can be. Anyways, I hope you all continue to enjoy 6 on audio. Both his arcs with Evelyn and Charlie are brilliant, in my opinion. Have a wonderful week. Thank you, Janelle. Thank you. So I want to say I think that's very insightful. Uh, I have heard Full Fathom 5. It's one of Big Finish's Doctor Who Unbound series, which is a series, most of which are good, though there's one that's terrible. Um, it's a series of audio plays where you have, like, parallel reality versions of the Doctor. You know, like, what if the Doctor never left Gallifrey or things like that. Um, and, and so I have heard that one and it's, and it's one of the, it's one of the good ones. It's not the awful one where the doctor is a female from absolutely fabulous. Oh gosh. (laughs) Yeah. But, um, I think that, I think that the writers of the show are inconsistent on the Valyard. I mean, when he's introduced in Trial of a Time Lord, he is, you know, kind of, they're ambiguous about exactly what he is, but they link him to the doctor's dark side which doesn't, as you point out, mean negative emotions, because negative emotions like anger can be prompted by compassion. Mm -hmm. And I think that's a very genuine insight on the part of the writers of the Big Finish production. I think that that's a good and concept that deepens what the Valyard is, 
but my sense is the Veilyard is um, is handled differently by different writers. I don't think all the writers have the same exact understanding of him. I think that the that that some of them have a more simplistic understanding of what the Veilyard is because he, I mean he, he was never allowed to have a definitive origin on the show because the showrunner John Nathan Turner didn't didn't want to be too specific about what the Valyard was. And so that leaves room for writers to interpret him differently. But I think I think you're right. Some of the writers are trying to go deeper with him and and do things like anger is not necessarily a bad thing. It can be pr- prompted by compassion. Mm. And it's it's interesting that he has been kind of developed where he's not just the mirror image evil doctor. Mm-hmm. You know, it's like you think of Star Trek with the mirror image universe or the split Kirk where you have the good Kirk and the evil Kirk. You know, you don't, it, that's not the Valyard. He is very different in how he is presented in that way. That, yes, mm-hmm. he is evil side. Of, he portrays the evil side of the doctor, but he's not just the evil, you know, mustache twirling villain side of the doctor. Like the master is, <laughs> he's yeah. not the master. Well, and even the master is depending, except for Anthony Ainley is, is actually a pretty complex character who some, mm-hmm. I mean, as far back as Roger Delgado, he was like, Hey buddy, we can rule the universe together and you can do good. Right, yeah. right. That's true. That's true. So our last email comes from Ted, who writes, When I started to listen to the last episode and heard that Mel was the companion, I feared an episode of her screaming, but thank God she did not scream at all during the episode or that, fat shame the doctor. <laughs> that did not The no screaming may have been one of her stipulations for being willing to do it. <laughs> yes, that's true. <laughs> Uh, then Ted says, at the beginning of the episode, you were talking about some spinoff series that would be interesting, and I have a few of my own. So uh, Ted had uh, quite a list, so I'm going to share uh, some of my favorites. He and says, these, uh, are, these are tongue-in-cheek. Yes, yes, these are all tongue-in-cheek. Silent Susan. Susan unexpectedly loses use of her vocal cords and can no longer scream. The doctor promises to find Susan help for her ailment, but realizes that he enjoys the silence and never really looks for help for Susan. Uh, the Doctor and Donna Show. Not what you expect. The 11th Doctor reverses the polarity one too many times and is replaced by the 3rd Doctor. Donna does not react well when the 3rd Doctor says to Donna, Be a dear and get me a cup of tea. Chop, chop. Fans of slapstick humor will enjoy hours of chuckles. Uh, The Life of Leela. Leela does stuff. Big hit with teenage boys and dads of all ages. Master's Peace Theater. This hit PBS series depicts the master and roles of various characters from theater. Each character wants to rule the world with a different plan. Julius Caesar makes you realize how things could have turned out. A2, Doctor? And then finally, Seaside Murder. Et, et. Sorry. <laughs> my, my terrible Latin pronunciation. Uh, a seaside... a is, is like French. I know. I, well, I took French in school, so that's mm-hmm. I see it and that's what I say. Uh, so I will fi- endeavor to be better. Uh, seaside murder the 13th doctor encounters the time meddler who puts her in a dream where her 12 year old son is murdered in a tranquil seaside town many plot twists occur when she realizes that an earlier incarnation of herself is the chief investigator and her father-in-law is the local vicar of course Mm. that's uh, the plot of broadchurch yeah So uh, th- these are not tongue in cheek, but a lot of similar ideas have actually been done by Big Finish. Big Finish has a series of stories centered on Susan and what happened after the Doctor ditched her in the mid twenty second century. Mm-hmm. Um, they and the just like William Hartnell says at the end of that, I shall come back. Well, he does as as uh, Paul McGann, the Eighth Doctor. And so you have a whole a whole series of Eighth Doctor stories involving Susan um, that lead up to a solo story uh, that Susan does by herself, where it's at the beginning of the Time War. The the time I think it's called something like Call to Duty or something like that. But the it's at the beginning of the Time War. The Time Lords are sending Time Cubes, you know, those message devices that the Second Doctor introduced um, in the War Games. They're sending time cubes to every time lord in known in existence, and that includes Susan. She gets a, a call to a call to battle, a call to duty to fight in the time war. And the eighth doctor tries to prevent her from receiving the message, but she receives it and decides to enlist. And so mm. it's a very dramatic story. 
then what was the second one? The third Doctor and Donna? They actually have uh, something like that with Big Finish, where you have the newer Doctors paired with older companions. Um, I, I and I don't know if they've do, if they've yet done. They may have older Doctors with newer companions. Uh, the third Doctor would be a little bit of a problem since John Pertwee passed on a number of years ago. Though recently they have gotten a voice double actor to play John Pertwee. And so having a third Doctor and Donna is not impossible. That would be um, awesome. <laughs> the, the, the third one was, was which characters now? Uh, well, there was the Leela one. But Leela, then there was, okay. Yeah. Leela, has, Leela has done, uh, Louise Jameson has done lots of big finishes, Leela. Wow. Unfortunately, it's all audio. <laughs> yep. Unfortunately. <Yeah. laughs> okay, the and next one was? The master in, uh, the big, uh, in uh, Masterpiece Theater, essentially. I thought there was another one in there. Uh... No, Susan. Just those? Okay. Yeah, those are the ones I picked. They were, he, okay. Ted had a lot of yeah, other he ones. Yeah, he had others. Yeah. yeah. Um, so the Big Finish has done a bunch of Master stuff. Uh, they have a few incarnations of the Master that are their own, but they also do other stories featuring Masters from the television show. And that in, they have multiple stories involving Christopher uh, Beavers, who's the second and better of the two disfigured masters from Tom Baker's era. He's done multiple stories. He's really good. One of them he even wrote himself. Uh, they also have the master from the Anthony Ainley's passed on, so they can't have him himself. They do have some like short trips featuring Roger Delgado's master and Anthony Ainley's master, even though they don't have the actors to play them. Uh, they have... The master who was the American from the 1996 TV movie, he's had uh, his his own audio set now, I think maybe two. He certainly had more than one appearance. Um, and then their most successful master series are, uh, seem to, right now, seem to be uh, The War Master with Derek, mm -hmm. Jake, J Derek Jacoby as The War Master and... Um, Missy with Michelle Gomez as Missy. And in fact, there was something else, which was the time meddler um, or the metal, the meddling yeah, that monk. was the broad church it was one. The, the broad church one. Yeah. Right. Yeah, the yeah. time meddler. Well, okay. Okay. So now I'm blanking on is the, is the time meddler the same character as the meddling monk? And I'm just blanking on that, but big finish has done a lot with the meddling monk. And in fact, he's in some of the Susan stories. And most recently, he's become a foil for Missy. Mm -hmm. And um, there's even a female version of the meddling monk, the, the nun, um, who doesn't like being called a nun even more Ooh. than the monk doesn't like being called a monk. <laughs> but, um, but you have, you know, Missy as the more chaotic and the meddling monk as the more hapless but still pretty chaotic guy. And they, it makes for a nice combination where the monk is regularly under the domination of Missy and frequently trying to get out of it. <laughs> nice. I, I will point out they did kind of do a variant on the third doctor and Donna with the first doctor and Bill. And that didn't work too well because they oh, misportrayed wow. the first doctor. Yeah. This was a twice upon a time. Oh, episode. right, right. This wasn't right. big finish. This was on TV. Yeah, and that yeah. didn't work out too well because they really misportrayed the first Doctor as much worse than he really was. Yeah, so I wouldn't have a lot of hope for a third Doctor and, and <laughs> Donna being portrayed well either. So, yeah. Although in in because of the how shrill Donna is as a character, you know, I mean, she really stands up for herself and she really pushes back. Uh, like, just think about when the when she was becoming the companion of the 10th doctor. And he says, all I want is a mate. And she flies off the hand. Not with me. <laughs> yeah. And so I can imagine the third doctor saying something that would set her off in a similar yeah. way. <laughs> Excellent. Well, thank you everyone for your feedback. We love to get your feedback and, you know, we, we'd certainly solicit it and uh, we, we look forward to getting more 
Before we wrap up, I want to take a moment to thank our patrons who make it possible for us to create the secrets of Doctor Who, including Daniel C., Father Jeff H., Arthur D., Jason C., and Kevin E. Their generous donations at sqpn.com slash give make it possible for us to continue the secrets of Doctor Who and all the shows at StarQuest. And you can join them by visiting sqpn.com slash give. We'd also like to thank Victor Lambs, who edited this episode. So that's it from us. You can let us know what you thought of this second Doctor story, The Dominators, by commenting on the show at sqpn.com or the Secrets of Doctor Who Facebook page, or send an email to Who at sqpn.com or visit the StarQuest Discord community at sqpn.com slash discord. You can watch The Secrets of Doctor Who in video on our YouTube channel at youtube.com slash starquestmedia and leave a message there. We'll be back next time. We'll be discussing the 11th Doctor Big Finish story, uh, which I didn't write down. Jimmy, what was that again? Do you remember? Um, <laughs> I will off quickly the top get of my head? The Calendar Man, the 11th yeah. Doctor Chronicles. There we it's go. It's like a <laughs> Batman villain. <laughs> I know the calendar man. <laughs> I am Calendar Man. I will assault you with dates. Until then, Father Cory Stika, thank you for joining me and sharing the secrets of Doctor Who. Thank you, Dom. Jimmy Aiken, thank you as well. Thanks, Dom. And once again, I'm Dom Bettinelli. Thank you for listening to the secrets of Doctor Who on StarQuest. And remember, we're taught to accept facts, being foolish to contemplate fantasy in the face of reality.